Welcome to Blazing Trails. I'm Michael Revo. Today, we're talking about something a little unexpected from Salesforce. I bet you didn't know that Salesforce has a research team that's being recognized for successfully creating an AI program that could build a protein to treat diseases like multiple sclerosis and arthritis. Through a partnership between Salesforce and UCSF, we took the code off the screen and brought it to the lab branch to prove that an AI program could in fact build a protein, something that hasn't been done before. So let's go behind the scenes with the lead researcher from Salesforce Research, Nikhil Naik, to learn about this transformative discovery and the impact that it will have in the medical world, as well as how AI research is being applied across industries. Welcome, Nikhil. Hi, Michael. It's great to be here. Well, this is really exciting. And as I said, it's a little unexpected from Salesforce. Uh, we don't really hear about Salesforce research that much. In fact, I'm look, kind of learning about it with everybody else. So can we get started and maybe give me a little overview of the Salesforce research team, what you do, what the mission is? Tell me about it. Sure. Uh, Salesforce research is the uh, main AI research lab of Salesforce. Uh, so we are a group of researchers, mostly with PhDs in machine learning and AI, uh, and our team's focus is to do both basic and applied research in artificial intelligence. And so we cover uh, a lot of areas of artificial intelligence, including natural language processing, computer vision, reinforcement learning, and we also apply these uh, research areas both for applications of uh, at CRM and also for applications for broader society. Uh, so part of our uh, goal of doing AI research is also to apply AI for problems which can have an impact on society. And as part of that goal, we have uh, worked on a variety of projects uh, using AI. Some examples include AI Economist. Uh, in AI Economist, we are applying AI to developing uh, better economic policy which hopefully can help society build a more uh, equitable and a better run society. We are also applying computer vision AI uh, to the problem of counting and tracking sharks uh, in the Pacific Ocean. And this is helping mm -hmm. us understand climate change and also uh, the behavior of sharks. Uh, in fact, we have also done research in medical AI uh, where we have worked with universities to develop an AI uh, that can help tell breast cancer patients an optimal path to treatment. Uh, and of course, we have worked on AI for protein design, which I think I'll go into more detail later in the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but just backing up a little bit, I, you know, AI is having such a, a moment right now with chat GPT and sort of entering everybody's consciousness, thinking about this new sort of generative AI. I think in the past, people have thought about it much more in a pure machine learning kind of context where uh, it, it's not coming up with something new. It's like, you know, how can we do a, a, a further analysis? But it, this new generative AI is really revolutionary. And I'm curious how we think about that at Salesforce with the sort of ethical concerns and, and with this, what this is opening up right now. And when you talk about AI for society as part of the, the, the mission of Salesforce research, tell me a little bit more about that framework and how you think about that. Sure, those are excellent questions. Uh, so as you rightly said, generative AI is really having a moment right now. And it's mm -hmm. really amazing what we can create using AI and the types of data we can generate in all different kinds of domains. Um, and as you say, uh, applying this technology in a very ethical manner is extremely important. And at Salesforce mm -hmm. Research, we work with our Ethical AI Council and Office of Ethics under Paula Goldman uh, to make mm -hmm. sure that all the AI that we build and deploy both at Salesforce and outside, uh, undergoes ethical reviews and that we make sure that we are following guidelines that help us deploy the AI in a careful manner. Uh, and so uh, in our team, uh, we have a program where almost every research is involved, where we are always thinking about how we can apply the AI we are developing uh, for applications for society. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we essentially try to identify AI techniques that we are very good at, uh, that we can uh, apply typically in collaboration uh, with universities or nonprofits, uh, and where we can identify problems um, where the AI could be applied uh, for an application where we can have a direct impact on society. Uh, 
Um, and so that's kind of our broader goal under the AI for Society program. Uh, and mm -hmm. we have been working on uh, various projects under this umbrella in the past uh, four to five years. Well, I see how that opens up so many opportunities to use the technology that we're building here at Salesforce. So let's get into this latest research, which is really exciting at Salesforce. It's ProGen. And again, this is a little outside of my, my area, so I'll try to ask uh, good questions about this. But tell me a little bit about how ProGen came about and, and what the project's all about. Right. Uh, so ProGen, uh, or AI for Protein Design, uh, was started a project in our team about uh, three years ago. Uh, and the goal uh, was that to apply generative AI and especially uh, large language models to the problem of protein design. Um, the project started because we realized that uh, the powerful language modeling technology that we were developing at Salesforce Research uh, can be directly applicable to the problem of designing novel proteins. And if you mm -hmm. were able to do so, it could open up a lot of applications for protein design in medicine and for applications of sustainability and others. Uh, so that's how the project really came about, where we decided to explore the use of large language models for designing proteins. And we, start, uh, we started working with academic collaborators to actually prove that technology works. Mm -hmm. I mean, so tell me a little bit about developing this gener you know, generative AI using these language models. Again, how are you ap approaching that from a uh, from a perspective of okay, we're trying to create a protein? Walk me through what that process is like. What, what, what how does that work? Sure. Uh, so uh, maybe to give the audience a bit of understanding of how large language models work. Large language yeah. models are these AI algorithms uh, that can uh, generate language. And very simply speaking, the way they work is that they ingest a large amount of text and they learn mm -hmm. to predict uh, the next word that might come after a given word. And mm -hmm. just by of training using this pretty simple method, uh, you can train an AI algorithm to generate very realistic language about any topic that you might be interested in. Um, mm -hmm. And what we realize is that uh, the same technology can be applied to generating proteins. Uh, so mm -hmm. proteins are you know, biological molecules and the way proteins are represented uh, in, in biology are using an alphabet of amino acids. So there are uh, 20 plus amino acids uh, that, uh, that constitute any protein. And just the way you know, the alphabet of English is used to represent any English word, any, English, any protein can be, can be represented using these amino acids. And so the same way you can train a large language model uh, to, um, uh, to predict uh, the next word and to generate sentences in English, you can train a large language model using lots and lots of protein sequences to be then able to generate novel proteins. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was kind of the, at very high level, uh, the, uh, the inspiration and the method behind uh, creating language models for proteins. And I mean, it seems like this is working pretty well in relatively closed sets of information, like you're saying with these amino acids, where, okay, you know, within these boundaries, we can create new uh, new sequences. How do you see this growing as it gets more and more sophisticated and the ability for these systems to be able to take on larger sets of information and, and come up with more novel ideas? Right. So uh, what's really cool about uh, the way proteins are represented with amino acids is that uh, any protein is essentially made of amino acids. So uh, you know, everything from a, a simple protein uh, that's an enzyme that can kill some bacteria to a very complex protein or chains of proteins that can help you cure cancer, they all can be represented using amino acids. Uh, mm -hmm. So where we see this research going, growing is uh, by exposing the models to uh, those kinds of data of, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, say, uh, drugs or of industrial enzymes that can be useful for, uh, say, degrading plastic, uh, you can uh, now uh, create new designs of proteins for these problems. And the, these proteins hopefully can be uh, as effective or more effective uh, than what we can design manually as scientists. 
and hopefully uh, the AI can also work together with scientists to kind of co-create uh, novel proteins and this process can be much more faster and efficient uh, than kind of the manual design process which happens right now uh, and as a result uh, we can accelerate the discovery of novel drugs and useful uh, industrial chemicals. And is this process how people are going about this <laughs> right now? Are you seeing a revolution in the space of basically everybody is using this AI technology and these models to to start to build all kinds of new things. I'd love to hear about, uh, you know, what are some of the problems people are trying to tackle and, and particularly with ProGen, but even just generally out there, what's happening as, as we start to accelerate this type of work. Right. Uh, so specifically in the field of protein design, uh, this is just the beginning for the use of AI, uh, uh, you know, both, uh, university researchers and, uh, industry uh, research groups are just starting to use AI uh, to understand if it can help in the process of uh, drug discovery, for example. So our okay. work was one of the very first in the world to show the promise of AI for designing useful proteins. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, since then, there have been other researchers who have built on our work uh, to show its applications in a variety of domains. Uh, and I think in the in the near future, we are going to see an explosion of uh, research and commercial activity in this space uh, to uh, uh, to use AI to accelerate you know these uh, these processes like drug discovery. So I think we are just at the beginning of this uh, revolution, so to speak. Yeah, it's super exciting. So tell me a little bit about, and this seems to be what's happening in AI generally right now is taking it from the theoretical and making it real. You know, now you can say to ChatGPT, you know, write me a wedding speech or whatever it is you need to do. And people are starting to take more advantage. This is trickling down now to to everyday folks being able to use the technology. It's a little different in moving this from the theoretical work you're doing to actually developing proteins with UCSF. But tell me a little bit about the partnership and how that worked and, and, and how we're making this real. Right. Um, so when we first developed this AI model uh, in-house at Salesforce, uh, we could use the model to generate new protein sequences, you know, in a, in a, in a computer. You could just see a string of letters come out of the model. Uh, but yeah. really the important question there is that, is this real, right? If you actually went and created this protein in a test tube, would this work? Uh, and mm -hmm. that's really the gold standard test uh, for a technology like this. Um, in a natural language model, you can just read an English sentence and say, yeah, this makes sense, it's sensible. But uh, for a protein language model, uh, no one can just look at a string of letters and tell you this protein will work. So, that, yeah. so that's why we started this uh, partnership uh, uh, both with uh, UCSF uh, and with uh, a, a biotech startup called uh, Tierra Biosciences. Uh, so you can think of uh, Tierra as a, a printer for proteins. You can send them a string of proteins and they can synthesize it, create in a test tube, and test it. Um, so mm -hmm. first we worked with Tierra uh, to test about 100 proteins generated by Salesforce. And that process itself took a few months. Uh, mm -hmm. But what that showed us is that uh, there was promise in our technology, uh, that it seemed like most of the protein sequences that we generated were working. Um, now, so it was time to then actually do a much deeper dive into these proteins and carefully test them uh, in a test tube. And that's when our collaboration with uh, UCSF came in. And these are these are new proteins. These are biological <laughs> proteins that have not existed before that were created through this process. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, scientists maintain really large online databases of all the proteins seen in nature. So when yeah. we create a protein, we are able to compare this protein against this large database and evaluate how similar is it to anything seen in the nature in the past. And what mm -hmm. we're able to show is that uh, we can design proteins that are even 60, 70 percent dissimilar to anything ever seen in nature, but that still is functioning protein. And that was a very, uh, that was an important scientific milestone. And how do you think about the distribution of it? I know, you know, there's a 
sort of an open source history, uh, you know, uh, of, of using tools like this to, to be open for folks to be able to do that. And it really increases development and creates community, all, all the thing that happens there. How do we think about who can access these tools and both from a Salesforce perspective and then generally industry-wide, how, how are we thinking about this right now? Right. Um, so uh, Salesforce research is uh, typically, uh, you know, typically uh, open source and research technology that it develops in-house. Uh, and our mm-hmm. goals are, just as you said, to, uh, to allow for transparency, to enable other people to build on our work, to also for them to understand our work better. Uh, and we feel that's really a uh, useful and important part of um, research because uh, I think uh, any technology can be you know, replicated and uh, reused if there's interest in a technology. So hiring it can only kind of keep it you know, under the lock only for some time. Uh, and so, yeah. but if it's open and it's out there, it actually enables us to understand it better because more people can use it, more people can interact with it. And that actually helps us probably create better safeguards around it. Um, I think it's definitely a question of debate around as AI becomes more and more powerful. Uh, if yeah. uh, some AI should be, you know, more uh, closed versus open and so on. Um, and I, I think it's an important discussion to have. Uh, but, uh, is, you know, at this point, it seems that uh, having open technology is beneficial uh, to advance fields. Yeah, I think uh, as I've been thinking about it more, it's a tool, just like many of the tools that have been developed. If you go back to main mainframe computers all the way up through mobile, et cetera, these tools continue to get faster and smarter, et cetera. But it's still the 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 ideas behind it and the human ingenuity of how you're going to use it that's really going to have a big impact. And it, yeah, so I'm curious. You're you're in this space. You're creating these and working with these AI models. Um, how much are you using any AI tools as part of your work right now? Are you co-creating with AI? Yes. So the I have <laughs> been uh, using AI tools like. Uh, the GitHub Copilot, uh, you know, to write yeah. code. Uh, I yeah. use the language modeling tools, you know, like ChatGPT, uh, to <laughs> help write better. Uh, and yeah. I have been enjoying working with them, working with them, and I feel like they have made me more productive uh, in my own work as well. What are the outcomes from Progen? What are you seeing? What kind of diseases is this going to help? Where is it going? Um, so we have uh, kind of two goals for Progen. Uh, so one is to obviously uh, make this technology available uh, to other researchers. So we have uh, open source and released uh, the code and technology behind it. And a lot of people are building on it to do their own research into a variety of applications. Uh, and I think concretely speaking, uh, it can help uh, develop protein-based drugs. So really the it's a tool that can help you accelerate drug discovery in a variety of um domains where protein-based drugs will be useful. Wonderful. Okay, well, this is super exciting research, and I learned a lot today that I didn't know about Salesforce research. So, Nikhil, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Michael. I enjoyed our conversation as well. That was Nikhil Knight, Director of AI Research at Salesforce. And for more information about Salesforce research, head over to salesforceairesearch.com. So if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to Blazing Trails wherever you get your podcasts or on the Salesforce YouTube channel. Blazing Trails is a production of Salesforce Studios, produced by Courtney Eltinge, edited by Cynthia Chavez with original music from Andrew Duncan. I'm Michael Revo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.